各位同学们、家长朋友们，大家好，我是元德教育的董老师。现在七点整，所以我们就正式开始。首先呢，非常感谢大家抽出宝贵的时间来参加我们元德教育的圣诞公开课。本次公开课呢，我们的安排是由阿木老师主讲的圣诞公开课。主要的话会针对几个大家对圣诞课程的疑问展开，里面会提到，呃，比如关于语法七十二变，还有莎士比亚以及写作提高等等的方面。在公开课前呢，我想先跟大家简单的分享两个很多家长朋友们关注的问题。第一个就是我们的网课是如何展开的。呃，这个问题呢，我们在昨天的公开课上已经与大家分享过，所以的话，我今天就简短的说一下给我们之前没有听过的朋友们。啊、呃，首先我们的网课管理呢是基于 Zoom， 嗯、呃、，Google Classroom 和 Zoom 展开的，主要分为三个部分，是课前、课中和课后。每个课程开始前呢，我们都会有呃一些。呃，那个班级的设置，我们会将相应的教学材料上传至相应的班级，以供学习学生们进行预习。在课程中呢，老师就会通过 Google Classroom 与学生互动，呃，比如进行学生的作业反馈，呃，也会使用课堂练习的功能，让孩子们做随堂测试。除此之外呢，我们也会把每节课老师的课堂资料及每节课的课程回放上传至 Google Classroom 里面，以供孩子们的课后复习。我们可以看到，这是我们的一些课程的展示。呃，另外的话，我们还会根据班级情况增加每日习题环节，每天都会将习题发布到相应的微信群里，就像现在展示的这个样子。呃，用来让孩子们养成并加强每日学习的习惯，并且呢，会根据学生的错题频率整理本月的错题情况。刚才展示的就是我们的一个错题集的情况。这个错题呢，我们会让老师在课堂中呃集中讲解。那么我们圣，那么我们圣诞和春假的课程会怎么进行呢？除了我们之前做过的这些以外，我们还会增加一个环节，是在课中的强制课堂笔记。呃，这个呢，主要目的是为了确保孩子们在课堂上能够跟上老师的节奏，呃，有助呃呃嗯、呃，并且有助于课后的一些复习。呃，这个是我们大概的一个网课如何展开。那么第二个想跟大家分享的呢，是关于我们的课程设置，因为很多呃同学们和家长朋友们对我们的印象是我们只教英文，其实并不是。我们的课程呢分为三个大类，有英文类、学科类和技能类。课程呢均有小班和一对一的课程，其中我们可以看到英文的话，我们分为基础英文。进阶英文，还有应试英文，比如一些 SAT、雅思、托福等等。学科类的话，我们就是有文科类、理科类。然后技能的话，我们像公众演讲，还有电脑操作等等，我们都有涉猎。那么，呃，我再主要跟大家详细介绍一下，就是我们大家比较熟悉的英文课程。英文课程我们是怎么设置的呢？我们分为基础和进阶。在基础类课程里面，我们又分为写作、语法和阅读三个大类。每个课程的话，我们都会分为四级，课程难度呢也会随着级别的升高而提高。我们现在以写作的课程为例，写作课程的话，学生呢会从最基础的段落写作开始学习。一路学习短文写作、论文写作，到最后的话，我们可以写出带有个人风格的一个学术文章。整个过程呢，学生大概要经历五十多篇文章之多。更多的，呃，更多的是呢，很多文章学生都要经过两三遍甚至更多遍的修改。那么在这个洗礼之后，学生就可以进入我们的进阶课程。我们的进阶课程主要是针对十年级以上的学生，那么我们这个课程的主要呃
设置呢更贴近学生学校课程的内容，很多的教学材料呢都是我们多年来收集各个学校的教学材料，所以的话对学生的学习话呃学习情况会更有针对性。那么这个就是我们的一个简单的课程设置，呃，希望能够解答一些大家对原则的疑惑。呃，如果大家有任何问题的话，欢迎随时联系我们。因为刚才介绍的有很多我们课程的详细内容，呃，可能特别快就过去了。如果大家有呃希望知道更多内容的话，就可以微信联系我们，然后我们会把详细的内容都发送给大家。呃，那么下下面的话就是我们今天的公开课。啊，让我们一起欢迎阿木老师，然后让他分享屏幕，跟我们分享一下他的呃公开课情况。Thank you very much for finding the time to come and to to find out more about us. And I can tell some of the students here are my、um, previous students, and there are new students here. Welcome.、Um, I was given several topics. The first topic is.、Um, In Chinese, 语法七十二变的宗旨是什么？学生如何在这个过程中掌握知识点 ？So,、um, so to say the seventy-two varieties, it is,、uh, it is a nickname that we give to a process of learning English tenses, particularly the English tenses and、um, the six functional、uh, types of sentences.、Uh, Affirmative statement, negative statement, affirmative yes no question, negative yes no question, and、uh, affirmative wh question and negative wh question. So twelve、uh, tenses times these times uh, these uh, six types of sentences. So that's seventy two、uh, sentences for one verb. So that's what we call here. We call it seventy two varieties. So let me demonstrate how that is done. All right. So I'll share share my screen with you. Can you see it? Are you seeing a PowerPoint or a different one? PowerPoint. You are seeing PowerPoint. My tenses, right? Yes. Okay. Good. 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 So that's what I want you guys to see. Um, so now let's let's look at the、uh, PowerPoint here. So this is, the title of this PowerPoint is tenses with do with the verb do. And my students, my old students here, they they have already they have already gone through this process in Chinese. Most of them are, so they know exactly what I'm talking about. Although I am. Talking to you tonight in English, so、um, we are going to learn to use the verb do, for example. So if you are interested in what are the seventy-two variety of sentences, so I'll tell you.、Um, I will demonstrate that by one verb that is do. So how does the verb do express tenses? Okay, to express tenses, first of all, we have to make sentences, right? To make a sentence, we need a subject, and in in English, if you are going to subject is a topic that you talk about, right? So it is the topic of a sentence. So we know that there are millions of topics in everyday life. So if you are going to make sentences with millions of topics, then it's very hard for you to concentrate on learning the verbs. So we are going to focus on the verbs. If we start to learn the seventy-two sentences, so to do that, we limit our subjects to these eight pronouns. Subject. That there's two octagons. Oh, okay. So we are going to limit our subjects to the、um, to the to these eight pronouns, subject pronouns, and these eight subject pronouns can be the substitute for millions of topics. That we can talk about. They can refer to all the topics under the sun. So,、uh, so now that we fix the subject and we move on to the verb. So, if you are going to make a sentence with the verb do, can you say, for example,、um, present tense? You just say he do it, okay? 
or if you ask question that he do it and you ask question why he do it or you want to say negative you say he not do it he do not it and why he not do it we all we all know that these are not English sentences to begin with. These are direct translations probably from Chinese. If you learn, you try to learn English word for word. So it doesn't work this way. We already know that, right? So, so no, it doesn't work like that. So how do I make it work? To make English verbs work, you have to build a machine. You have to build a structure, okay? So that the verb conjugates, the verb changes depending on situations, right? For example, it changes its form according to the number or person of the subject, which uh, if you haven't learned English, you don't know what that means. And most of my students now know that, right? And then of course the verb immediately Okay, if you say I, I study, immediately that study already tells you the time of the action. And then it also cooperates with other words to form structures to tell you stages of action, right? Whether it's continuous or perfect, or you can call that aspects of action. So it also cooperates with other words to form structures to report active or passive voice. All right, so it also forms structures to report the to report the mode of the action. Okay, whether it is probability, advisability, right? All these things are expressed by modal verbs, right? So again, it is the verb that tells those modals, and then um, it also determines if the sentence is giving information or asking for information or if it is positive or negative. All these things are done by the verb do itself or in cooperation with other auxiliary verbs. So in other words, it gears with many other requirements. So it actually, it changes its form because of the neighbors, because the other, the changes of other words. So, to, so to learn the verb do is not to learn the verb alone. It is to learn the system, how this verb gears with other elements of the sentence, how it works with, with other words. So in, our, in, in, in other words, it, we, instead of learning singular words, we are learning a relationship and not only one relationship, a whole set of relationships. So that is where the most important learning happens in English language. And that is what I have been trying for so many years to tell people that we are not learning English the right way if we are learning words and translating them into your mother tongue and believing, okay, that's it. That's, that's, the, that's the word that I learned and that's the sentence I should say, no. You have to learn these things first. And most of us haven't learned this. And to learn it is not just to come to my school and hear me talk about it once or twice, right? Many of my students can attest to that. Many of my students studied with me, went through all the classes, but when it comes to the time that they make the sentences, they still make mistakes here and there. Why? Because they, now they learned the system, but they haven't learned it. They haven't practiced so much, practiced enough so that it becomes a habit of their own. So to learn is really to practice so many times so that it becomes your own skill, not just to come and to learn, to hear I talk about it. So here we are, the conjugation issues with tenses, right? So um, the first conjugation issue is tenses, is to allow the verb to tell time. So the verb has to change its form or construct structures to tell time and to tell stages of action. 
That's two things. Whenever we talk about tenses, it's actually a, it's a, actually a 3D concept. Meaning you have to have a verb first and the verb has to tell time. Not only that, the verb has to tell stages of action or aspects. To do all these things all at once, you have to learn that skill, all right? That is learned, that is foreign to us, and that is very English. And if you are able to learn that, then, then you start to learn English. Next one. So how do we, how do we do that? All right, to do that, you have to go step by step. So the first step, of course, you have to learn really well about the verb that you're going to use. You need to learn its past form, its present form, its future form, and its present participle and past participle. So any one verb, you cannot say do, oh, I translate into a Chinese word, that's it. That's not it yet, okay? So if you have an English verb do, then you have to find out all these other forms because the verb do is only the name form it is a it is a name that we give that verb all right and we give that whole family it's a surname of the whole family of verbs all of them are do okay they belong to the do family all right but in a do family you have you have members such as did, that's its past form, do or does, that's okay. present two forms, okay. yeah. and then future form will do, and then present participle doing, past participle done, all right? So to learn English verb, to learn do, you learn all of these things. So all my students now know that to learn the verb break, you have to learn break, broke, broken, Okay, breaks or will break or breaking. You have to know all these different forms first before you do anything, all right? So you have to get into this habit, okay? Asking yourself every time you ask yourself, do I know the different forms of this verb? So, so asking about the knowledge points, these are the knowledge points. You come to the school, if you are going to learn anything, if you are going to learn a verb, and then you learn the different forms of the verbs first, all together. We don't do piecemeals. We don't say, ah, we are going to learn it here today and tomorrow I'm going to learn that. You learn it all at once. So you, you form that habit. You ask yourself, you, if anybody asks you, say, do you know how to, how to use the verb make? You say, make, mate, mate. Yeah, I know how to do that. Okay? You have to know all these different forms. So the first thing my students memorize is the irregular verb forms. So once you memorize that, then you can you can tell which ones are irregular and which ones are regular. That is the very good beginning of learning English. But learning all the different forms is not learning how to make sentences, right? So now, now that we know the forms, the second step is we tell time. Um, we, we start with telling the simple time, meaning we simply tell whether it is past or present or future. So to do that is sort of simple. To do that, we don't need to construct tables, construct structures. We just use the past form to talk about past tense, present form to talk about the present action, and the future form to talk about future action. So that, is easy all right so example so if i'm going to talk about past and then my verb is do i'm going to say this happened in the past all i have to do is use the verb did no matter who the subject is he did it that's past tense present okay he does it all right using the present form or they do it so there you go, there's a little thing you have to pay attention to. Once the number of the subjects change, change, and then the verb form has, the verb forms have to change to, to be in agreement with the subject. And we go on to talk about future. 
All, ha all you have to do is use the future tense. That is the simple part, right? That is, so the simple tense, now we understand it is simple, meaning you use the verb to tell time, that's it. There's nothing else. You just talk about the action and you talk about the time of the action. However, we have to talk about other things. You have to talk about aspects with that verb. How do you do that? Now we come into a little technical discussion to form the continuous tense, to express continuous tense. You have to form a structure. How do you do that? First of all, your verb do has to be changed into present participle form. And then you have to fix an auxiliary, you fix another verb in front of it so that you form a structure first. And so I like to use a marker to demonstrate that all the time. So for example, let's, let's imagine this is a verb, okay? And then first of all, you have to change the, change the you know, cylindrical verb into, into a form, into a shape. Let's imagine this is the ing form of the verb do, okay? This is a name form of the verb do, change it into ing form. And then on top of that, you have to fix another thing in front of it. So you change that to tell time, all right? So here we are, this is our verb do, change it into ing, and then put a B in front of it. Now that's it, that's continuous tense. So if you want to talk about past continuous tense, you change the B into past form. He was doing it, okay? If it's a present, you change the verb into is, he is doing it. And if it's a future, you change the be into future form, he will be doing it. So that's it. So it is a, it is a structure. It is not one word, remember that. Okay, now we go on to talk about the perfect tense. How do I construct a perfect tense? Same. You first of all change your verb do to its past participle form, which I use VD2 to represent it. And then you put a have in front of it. Now you change the have to tell time. Have goes to the past tense, becomes had. So this is past perfect tense. And then present perfect tense, have goes to the present and the subject is singular. So it's has done it, okay? Future will have. That have changes into future form, but the verb is still done. So will have done it, all right? So now we finish nine tenses. You go on to the tense tense, past perfect tense and you change your verb into ing form, and you form a continuous tense like this, b-i-n-g. But you have to change that into perfect tense. How do you do that? You change this b into perfect tense, have been, and then add the ing to it. So have been doing something. And now, now, again, the, this is the three elements now, right? It's not just the two element. It's a three element structure. You change the first verb to tell time. Past had been doing it. Present has been doing it. And future will have been doing it. All right. So now, after all these steps, I am able to make 12 sentences, all right, to tell the different time and aspects of the verb do. It's just one verb. I can make 12 tenses, 10, 12 sentences, all right? And then you will say, wow, that's a lot of sentences. Yes, and if you are learning these sentences, you're learning these tenses one at a time, then you will be very confused because there's so many sentences. 
so many tenses. That's exactly how we learned when we were at middle school, when, when we are at school in China. We learned the, these tenses at one lesson and maybe one or maybe two of these tenses at another and then later on another and then by the time we start to learn these guys we already forgot about them so that's why it we learn it all together we learn it wholesale we do do not learn it piecemeal so now we finished learning only tenses so if you ask me what are you are you guys doing with the 72 varieties of a verb okay we are only doing the first 12 here and once that is done okay we have to use sentences to do two things right first we give information that is statement secondly we ask for information right that's question here okay so now that we learned the verb do it has 12 tenses so there you go so that we just formed the 12 sentences we formed i'm i'm showing five the 12 sentences that we've made they are affirmative statements okay and then you are going to learn how to say no with them all right you learn the negative 12 and then you're going to learn how to raise yes no questions with them say so you learn the affirmative yes no question 12 of them and then you're going to ask questions with no in them negative questions did you not do it does he not do it did he not do it does he not do it so you're going to ask negative yes no questions so how many have we done now four times 12 already now there are two more to go. You are going to learn the affirmative WH questions. You ask, why did he do it? Why does he do it? And so on. And then you learn negative WH questions. Why did he not do it? And 12 different times. All right, so I'm using why just to exercise. Of course, you can ask questions, WH questions with when, where, what, when, where, why, how, who, what, lots of it, right? So there you go. So that answers my first question, I believe. The first question is, the first question is, uh, what happens at your 72 variation class? That's what happens. That's what we learn. And um, I tell my students, English is a, snakes language okay first of all the sound is a lot of s, s right secondly the most important most important information of this language it is at the very beginning of the learning just just like the most important organ or most important vitals of a snake is at somewhere close to the head that's exactly the same with english the most important information is close to the beginning. And this is the most important information. My students who have finished learning, learning this uh, stage four, stage three and stage four of my grammar, they will know what exactly I am talking about. English becomes so much easier to learn at the latter stage, okay? And the, the most difficult part is here, is at the beginning is with the verbs. So, um, so what are the learning points here? You already noticed the learning points are pro now, right? Um, that basically means person and the number of the subject. And then verbs, different forms of the verbs, irregular and regular verbs, right? And then subject verb agreement, questions, negations, all these things are learned all at once. So you learn them one verb at a time. Once you learn that, your English becomes very good. Okay, so now that's it. That's my answer to the first question. Do you guys have any questions to ask?
Yes? No? No questions, eh? Hey, right, if you have no questions, that's good. I will go on to the next one, next topic. Now, do you see my PPT? Ah, Shakespeare. Do you see it? I see it. Good, thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for telling me. All right, see, this is my fancy PPT. Wow, very artsy, isn't it? I didn't do it. It's actually, uh, the PPT actually has all these choices. I am discovering computers nowadays. So, ah, Shakespeare, eh? So we are going to talk about Shakespeare. The question is, what are you guys going to learn in Shakespeare classes? And um, let me see the questions. Say, so, yeah, what are you going to learn there? And then how do you understand him, understand Shakespeare? Um, I don't, <laughs> Shakespeare is very difficult to understand. All right, when I was a student, I didn't enjoy it at all. And I, but with the change of time, with, uh, with the advancement of my age, I started to appreciate it a lot more. So um, I'll tell you what I missed when I was a student. If I knew all these things, I might, I might be interested in it way longer. Okay, long before what I have done. Okay, so Shakespeare, the question is, why should we and how shall we study him? And what will we read in this class, in my class particularly? So that is the question, those are the questions I answered. So the first question is why, okay? Why do we study Shakespeare? And it's actually very easy to answer it in Canada, in Vancouver, in BC. Uh, it is easy to answer because you just have to. And if you are, you are studying at uh, colleges, at I mean, at secondary schools here, you just have to learn Shakespeare. It is a part of the curriculum. And um, you usually have to learn one or two play, right? Um, to get good marks, to graduate from high school with flying marks and uh, to get to your dream university, you'd better know him and you'd better know how to read his plays, okay, how to, how to get good marks out of his play. So that is a simple answer. And of course, if you insist on why, why is he important? Why is he such a big deal? And he is, he is a very important person very big deal, very big deal in, according to many different people, all right, for many different reasons, okay? Uh, first reason is he is accredited with the invention of many English words. In fact, an old version of the Oxford English Dictionary said that he invented 33,000 words English. But that was an old version, okay? That is the version that published between 1884 and 1928. Um, I give you the link. So this is where I, I find this information. Um, in fact, if you just ask the question, say how many words um, did Shakespeare invent? Then you will have different answers from the internet. So um, the this is the this is the, the, the biggest number that I found. And then some say he invented 1,700 words. That's a lot of words too, right? But then there, there are people say, no, not so many. I don't think so. And then finally, the lowest number is 422. Nonetheless, all right? So um, even if he has invented 422 words, then he is he is a creator of that language to a certain extent, right? That is not the point. So the point is he is able to use the simplest words to say what is on the tip of your tongue or my tongue, right? But you and I just cannot utter it regardless if it's a thought, a murmur of love or an utterance of outrage. We 
speak English, we speak the language, but when it comes to time to express it so well, he does it the best, okay? And he does it not only very eloquently, but very succinctly and simply. Let's take to be or not to be for an example, right? Say everybody, whenever you say Shakespeare, and then they'll say to be or not to be, okay? So why is this line such a big deal? If we study it carefully, we will find it is a big deal. First of all, to be or not to be is talking about a subject that is very important, right? It is talking about whether I should live or I should die. It's talking about life and death matters, a very important, huge theme in human life and in human literature. And according to Kurt Vonnegut, a favorite writer of mine, all right, he is, he's written a book uh, about English style and it is the most famous book about English style, about how to write all right, in English. So um, this sentence is succinct. According to, according to Kurt Vonnegut, he said, William Shakespeare and James Joyce wrote sentences which were almost childlike when their subjects were most profound. I told you their subject, the subject is about life and death, but he's talking in such simple sentences, to be or not to be, right? To be or not to be asks Shakespeare's Hamlet. The longest word in this line is three letters long. That's how cool he is, right? And that three, three letter long, long word is not, of course. And if you are interested in learning all that, uh, this is a link that I posting here. And the, my opinion of the sentence, now that I'm a grammar teacher, I discovered that he uses the verb be, normally a mere aux, auxiliary or link verb and he uses it as an action word so that it names the state usually ignored by the English way of thinking. The English way of thinking puts a lot of emphasis on action, all right? It does not pay attention to verb be. In fact, in a lot of writing suggestions, they want you to change your be verb into other verbs, more active verbs. But here, to be or not to be, to be becomes to live, to exist, and no action, but just to be, all right? To be there, right? So it's uh, very nice. Um, so these are examples of how powerful and how skillful his usage of English words are. The second reason is his quotes are ubiquitous, meaning you can find things that he said everywhere, everywhere around you, all right? For example, that the one that we just quoted, or you can say also, um, you hear people say this all the time, he, in uh, As You Like It, Act 2, Scene 7, okay, we find Shakespeare saying, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits, exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts. So when I was learning this as a student, okay, I find it very cute. I find it very cool. I find it very Shakespeare. But now that I am over 50, when I look at it again, I find it very cool. I find it very Shakespeare, okay? But it is a different understanding. It's not just a metaphor anymore. It is truth and it means so many things. All the other, all the, detail of the drama, I put it in for myself, 
okay? So that is how Shakespeare is working. He grows with you. So that's why we should start learning it earlier. All right, so next one, the quotes again. I'm saying that the quotes are everywhere. Some bequeath wisdom. So for example, he, he says, what's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell less sweet, right? And then he says, to thine own self be true. Isn't that a powerful advice to anybody, right? To thine own self be true. All that glit glitter glisters is not gold, all right? So very smart talks. And then sometimes he also talks about friendship, love, and literary style too. For example, he says, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your years. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. So this is Julius Caesar. And this is the beginning of a speech and very nice. And we, today we always hear people say, lend me your years before the start of a speech. And that comes from here. And then another point on love, love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. And therefore is a winged Cupid's painted blind. So the first part is already very powerful, right? Number nine about style and he is very good at what he teaches other people to do. He says, brevity is a soul of wit. And he is able to write very brief, very succinct sentences to say so much more. And others deal with characters and success. For example, he say, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them, all right? And he says, cowards die many times before their death. The villain, the valiant never taste of death, but once, okay? So all these quotes from this website, I should point it out, okay? So, and you can, if you want to read more quotes by Shakespeare, you can go there very, very good stuff. So that's why we admire him. He has basically said all the smart things that people can say. And we understand this, this type of people, don't we? Okay, so it is safe to say that he represents the English language and culture, or he is partially the English language and culture itself. So that's how important he is. And that's why we should learn about him. Um, and there are many other reasons, like I already told you, right? Many other reasons why he is important. And in our culture, in the Chinese culture, we know somebody else, we know a person who is comparable to him, all right? We know why we study the person who said all of these things, all these smart, smart things, right? We are Fu Tie Gui, you are Ru Fu Yun. Right? All these things are said by Confucius. And Shakespeare is to English is not any different from Confucius is to Chinese. And Shakespeare is one and the only. Whereas in in ancient China, there are a lot of a lot of smart people like Confucius. So we understand why he is important. Now we ask the next question. How shall we study Shakespeare, especially at Ron Learnings? Okay, we study him. Um, and if you want to study Shakespeare here, you have to work hard. So we are going to learn we're going to study Shakespeare by working very hard. And to study him that I plan to do first is we are going to 
every time we study a play, we are going to treat each play as a real life situation. Okay, we read the situation. For example, if we are reading Hamlet, we're going to ask, what is his problem, right? If I am faced with the same problem, how would I solve it? So, you all, so that's the identification part. You identify with the character, you bring yourself into the situation and you ask yourself, would I kill my friend, okay? Like Macbeth did, just because the witches told me that his children and the children of his children are going to be the king. Would I kill my best friend just because of a fortune teller told me something? You ask yourself these questions and then you can understand the, the play way much better. And then of course you can compare yourself to Hamlet. You say, would I make decisions better, make decisions faster than Hamlet? Why is it so hard for him to make up his mind? All right, and we're going to write. We write our own plays dealing with the similar situation. And that is the time when you can compare and you can, you can see, you can tell, all right, let's try our hands, all right? Just to embarrass ourselves, not really, just to know like what kind of considerations, if we are, you are faced with the same task, all right? We are writing a play, just like Shakespeare is writing a play, but if we are faced with the same situation and then see how Shakespeare deals with it, amazingly, way better, right? And then we're going to read it out loud. And Shakespeare is very funny. Shakespeare, um, if you are reading it like it's a book, then you miss the whole point of it. And uh, the first time I, I saw a performance of Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's play is here in Vancouver uh, uh, at Bard on the Beach. Every summer, um, there's one event called Bard on the Beach. So uh, Shakespearean companies will come and put, put, uh, put up uh, performances, all right? And then uh, I, watched, uh, I watched Hamlet and I watched uh, uh, Tempest, which I loved the most, and then um, and the other plays. So um, when I watch The Tempest and I suddenly understand, wow, this guy is really good. It is, it is from then I started to, to allow myself to read a lot more about him. And in the old days, I'm not interested in, in Shakespeare. Okay? I find it very old, very boring, but that's my own miss, right? I missed it. Um, now, um, and when I, when I watched uh, the, the play, The Tempest, I realized that this guy is not really all English. This guy is probably Chinese. Let me explain that later. So I, and from then on, I find that he is different. He is so different that he really, and I like to say this a lot. I say, so look at him. He, he said many bad things about women and he's too popular, all right? He's, he's anti-Semitic, anti all right? He said bad things about Jews, he's too popular. So he is beyond reproach, right? And then you find out you want, you want why. And then he discovered that, that this is one playwright and one play it has been been on the stage for four, more than 400 years and it is still alive people can still find new things in his place so that's he is just uh, amazing okay so um but we're going to read it all right read it out loud so that you can get the rhythm you can get get to know what he's talking about way better and then we are also going to try to act a little bit, part of his play. So when you're acting, then the way he's saying things, the feelings, the emotions will, will be better understood. And uh, we are going to ask questions. For example, we are going to ask this question. 
why is the balcony scene so influential? So, for example, the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet. Okay, Juliet is on the balcony talking to Romeo at night. And then why is that so influential? Let me show you examples of how influential it is. The Pope does it. Hitler did it. Mao used to do it many times. Elon Peron did it, Argentinian. And this guy did it, does it too. So what is the fascination with balcony? And then by studying it, we will find out that, that Shakespeare is the first person who did this. And then all these people just copy it, all right? And all of people did it. They all did it. And then, of course, asking such questions, and then we'll write, and we'll write a lot. So we'll find out something new to say about Shakespeare, and, and we also will be able to train to find out something new to say about all literary work, okay? And we will make such investigations and write about our discoveries. And the most important thing is, we will further the study of Shakespeare by contributing our own cultural angle, okay? We will look at Shakespeare from our cultural point of view and prove that Shakespeare is more Chinese than being English, all right? So that's what I said when I, when I, um, Went to the went to watch Tempest. So the Tempest, the uh, the scholar there, okay, and he is almost like he immediately reminds me of the Chinese stories of um, of those uh, uh, of those immortals, okay, living in the mountains, who is able to do all kinds of tricks, who is able to do to do uh, uh, interplanetary travels. Right? And then I find, wow, there's a lot of similarity between the old, old Chinese thinking. And, um, and I was very surprised to find out that this person, okay, uh, you, can, you can use this link and to find out. And there is a scholar who said, wait a minute, I discover a lot of Taoism in Shakespeare's plays. That's exactly what I would say too. But uh, we will do that. We will do, share those things in, um, in our classes. So if you ask, what are you going to read? I'm going to choose from one of these titles. We'll probably study only one of them because we don't, uh, uh, they, they tend to be very difficult to read, uh, very hard to learn. So yeah. Um, if, if you guys want to, if you guys want to learn and then you tell us which one is of interest to you. So if there is enough, there are enough people in Rolling Point, then we can start one and discuss Shakespeare and, um, make it our, make it our discovery journal journey. And, um, I am more and more interested in this person whom I detested when I was a student, which is, of course, my miss. So that's it. That is the question that I answered. And that leaves me with only three minutes for the next question. The next question is actually, I can answer it very directly and very simply, all right? Uh, the next question is, uh, what is the basic, what is the basic formula, format for writing? And how can you improve your grades at school in a short time? Um, I am reluctant to promise that you can 
improve your writing skill in a very short time. Um, it doesn't happen. Because to tell you the truth, the formula of English writing is very simple. I'll find the formula to, to share with you. I've been teaching English writing, okay, with formula and with a lot of practice, but the success rate, okay, is okay. Um, the reason is very simple because many people have the misconception that if you, if you go to a good school, if you learn with a, with a good teacher, then your English writing will improve very quickly and your marks will increase very quickly at school. Marks will be reflected at school very well. Um, that's not the case. The reason is very simple. The reason is to do that, you need a lot of exercise. So the question is very easy to answer. It depends on how ready you are to work on a very simple formula. So can you see this? I'm showing you a very simple formula of all the, all the English writing formula that you need for your high school success. All right. So first of all, it's a paragraph. You have a topic sentence. Supporting idea one, detail. Supporting idea two, detail. Supporting idea three, detail. And then concluding sentence, final comment, done. And then description essay, opinion essay, cause and effect essay are written in this formula. I mean, this is a paragraph, not essay. All right. And then to write narrative writing, you write it from this way up, all right? You start with your exposition. You tell me a problem. Problem gets worse, even worse, all right? And it gets to the point that it almost seems, okay, impossible to solve. And finally, solved. Resolution. That's the narration. That's a story. That's narrative writing, too. And then comparison contrast writing. Two parties compared. All right, compared against certain points. You tell me whether they are similar or different, and that's it, all right? Very easy. And then to write essay, all you have to do is blow it up, right? You do a little introduction, body paragraph, conclusion. Introduction, and then body paragraph in narrative form and conclusion. And then your comparison contrast essay form. Done. That's format. And I've been teaching this to all my students. And some of my students learn very fast. Okay. And some of them do not learn very fast. Many reasons. One reason is it depends on how focused you are, how willing you are ready to change your old way of thinking and to 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 adopt to this way, this is a way of thinking. This is an order of, of um, communicating your thoughts, okay? And then you have to switch to this way of thinking. So switching, right, depends on your willingness to switch and your willingness to practice, all right? If you are willing to practice, we could do that very easily. We could change your marks at school without any problem. So it is, it is um, on my part, my responsibility is to explain this to the students very clearly, which I am confident I do it very well. But whether students can pick it up, that is on the student's court of the ball. All right, so that's it. So that's the time that I have. And then I've answered all your questions. And I would like to know if you have any questions.
Do you have questions? Not really. No, Nico. <laughs> All right. No. No, good. So that's it. That's uh, that's all I have to say. And you're welcome to to our to our classes, to to our grammar lessons, writing lessons, and other science lessons and mathematics lessons too. Okay. Thank you very much for your interest. 好的，非常感谢大家来参加我们这次的公开课。呃，大家现在还有什么其他问题想问阿木老师的吗？好的，如果没有问题的话，啊、呃，我们可以在群里面互动。啊、呃，我会把今天的课程呃整理一下，然后变成一个可以上传的视频，然后传到群里。然后我们如果有想要回顾的小伙伴们，可以就是。再看一下。另外的话，如果大家对课程有任何任何的问题，欢迎随时联系我们，呃，我们都会非常愿意帮助大家解答。好的，谢谢大家。Thank you guys.